Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to head to Germany once again and we're going to go back to Munich and revisit one of the famous city breweries down there. And this is a beer that I've actually tried when I've been in Munich, but I've just never sat down and done a review of it for you here on the channel, which is a little bit strange because it is a bit of a classic and it's also a style of beer that I very much enjoy. But if you've watched the channel before, you will know that I'm a huge fan of my German lager beers. So for this review then, we are going to return to the Stadtliches Hofbräu House München and we're having a taste of the Hofbräu Original which comes in at 5.1% ABV and this one is their Helles Lager. So um, yeah, this beer, I had this at Hofbräu House in München and this was before I was filming the out and about videos that I do on the channel now, otherwise I would have done that so I think another little visit down to Munich might be in order at some point in the future and I'll go around and visit the sort of original um, Brauhauses for each of these, uh, each of the famous Munich breweries of course. But I've had their Dunkel before, I've reviewed the Dunkel for you on the channel and I think I've also reviewed their Oktoberfest beer as well. So cool to go back and finally have a go at the original one for you here and as always I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this beer. So anyway, as is usual with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Hofbräu München before. No doubt there will be some more at some point in the near future. There's all the usual social media down there as well. If you want to see more beer reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system, so you can go into the homepage and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, prefecture, whatever it is you're interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries. There is one there for all the German beers that I've reviewed for you. That's being added to very regularly. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely hugely appreciated so anyway to tell you a little bit about Hofbräu then so Hofbräu onto my brewery notes. Hofbräu was founded back in 1589 by Wilhelm V, Duke of Bavaria. So he didn't like the beer that was brewed in Munich at the time, so two of his advisors recommended that he should start his own brewery. And for this task, he hired brewmaster Heimel and Pongratz of the Geisenfeld Monastery to plan, build and operate this brewery. So Wilhelm's son, Maximilian I, was more a fan of Weiss beer rather than the brown beers that were popular in the area at the time. So in 1602, he kind of abused his power a little bit and banned all other other breweries from brewing this style and created a monopoly for his ducal brewery. So the Weiss beer proved to be very popular and so the brewery had to relocate in 1607 to the Pratzel and then a few years later in 1610 sales of the beer from this brewery were permitted to private businesses. Pongratz's successor who was Elias Pichler, he created the first Maibock in 1614 using the Einbeck method and apparently he paid the Swedish army 344 pails of this beer during the Thirty Years War to stop them from plundering the city. So. You know, obviously you can bribe armies with beer back in that time. But in 1810, King Maximilian I Joseph threw a huge wedding party for his son Ludwig and wife Teresa. And this included a huge feast with beer taverns and all of this kind of thing. The beer taverns had specially brewed beers. And this was repeated every year. And it became what is now known as Oktoberfest. So it was Hofboy München who were the ones who uh, who started the Oktoberfest, actually. In 1828, though, Hofboy opened up their first tavern. And Ludwig apparently kept a close eye on the beer, on the price of the beer, rather so that all citizens could enjoy it. And because the beer was so popular, the company had to officially register their logos as trademarks back in 1879. In 1896, the brewery had to expand, so a new brewery building was built over the storage, uh, storage cellars on Einerwiener Straße, and the old building on the Pratzel became the first Hofbräu house, opening its doors in September of 1897. And I do highly recommend that you go there, because it is a little bit of an experience to be in that Munich beer hall. Um, during the Second World War, though, the brewery suffered heavy damage, and only a small part of it was in still in working order in 1945. Several tankers, though, survived, having been safely stored, and Oktoberfest took place once again after the war in 1949. And 1950 was the first time that the mayor personally at the first keg of beer to open the festival and that has since become a little bit of a tradition and this was also the first time that it was the a Hofbräu beer that was used as the opening keg. Over the following years the building on the Pratzel was restored by Valentin Emmert and it was completed in 1958 in time for Munich's 800th anniversary. But in, 80, in, in 1972 rather they inaugurated their famous 50,000 square foot tent at the Munich Beer Festival and then in 1988 they built a new brewery outside of the city which could produce 6.6 .6 million gallons 
gallons of beer per year, and this was later extended in 1995. Over the following few years, many Hofbräuhaus locations have popped up across the world. The brewery continues to expand, and the original Hofbräuhaus celebrated its 100th birthday in 1997. This original site is also home to the famous statue of Julius the Brewer, which returned in uh, 2008 after being destroyed in the Second World War. And as part of the, this was part of the celebration for the 400 years of beer culture on the Pratzel Square. So um, yeah, a very historic brewery, this one. That's all I can really tell you about Hofbräu just now. They do have quite a few different beers. There's this one, there's the Original, the Dunkel, um, the Schwarze Weiss, they've got a Maibach, they've got a summer beer, and they also have an Oktoberfest beer, if I remember correctly as well. I'm not sure if these guys do a Doppelbach, I'll need to look into that, because if they do, I really want to try it for you on the channel, but um, I always enjoy trying these Munich Doppelbachs. But these guys, as I say, um, probably, I think they're actually the biggest of the... Um, the Munich breweries by volume other than Paul Lanner, um, but Paul Lanner of course brew the Hacker Shore beers too, which is the reason that they're so big. So I think this one might be the biggest by volume, uh, how would you say that? I think this the, the Hofbräu brand is the largest by volume brand of the Munich beers. I'm sure one of the German folk that I was talking to in Hofbräu at that time was telling me that. But a very historic brewery and somewhere that I really do recommend that you visit if you find yourself in Munich. And try their Dunkel beer as well. Like I said, that's one of my favourite lager style of, uh, lager beer styles. Probably that along with the Doppelbock. Those two are probably my favourite, but I do enjoy and appreciate a nice health as well. But yeah, that's all you really need to know about about Hofbräu Munich, uh, Munich for the moment. Hof, of course, when it comes to these beers, refers to like royal connections, princely connections, and you'll find that on quite a lot of um, of German breweries, of course. But if you want to learn more about this brewery, as I said, check out the brewery website in the description below. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram, and of course, um, all the different Hofbräu houses around the world tend to have their own Facebook feeds and things like that. And if you want to learn more about the different beers, again, check the website, and you can look at the Rate Beer and Untapped pages as well. But um, yeah, let's get on and actually have a taste of this beer then. We can get rid of the brewery notes now. Um, so yeah, as you can see, this one has the picture of the um, the Hofbräu House on the Pratzel in Munich, um, and it's as I say, it's a very pretty old building. Munich is a really nice um, city, actually. The older parts of Munich have been really nicely restored after the war, but there's a lot of modernity to it and things as well. It's kind of an iconic city, um, but yeah, there you can see the Hofbräu bottle cap on this one. The crown, as I mentioned, is the kind of royal connection that this brewery had. There is the little top label on this beer and on the back of course you can see it has the um, the European symbol as a kind of protected uh, or basically Bavarian beer, Bayerische beer is protected geographically by the European Union and I think originally it was the German government that did it then the European Union have kind of taken over that mantle if you like because they do the same with uh, Czech beer and uh, you know champagne and scotch whiskey and stuff like this too so um yeah a half litre bottle this one this only cost me incidentally only cost me 20 swedish crowns which is the equivalent of about um probably like two euros or one euro 80 something like that so i mean if you think that you would pay about a euro a euro 20 or something like that for this bottle in germany i think that's pretty good that's one of the great things about say stemberlaga of course is they do keep the beer uh, the prices of the beer down and they'll give you some pretty good ones as well so let's get this guy out and we will get on with the tasting then. I need to add that to my collection. I'm not sure if I have a Hofbräu um, bottle cap, but let's get it out and into the glass. So yeah, as I've told you on previous German reviews, I do have a half litre um, a half litre sort of stein glass, but it's not colourless. It's it's um, it's one of these kind of clay ones, and that's from uh, that's from one of the breweries up in Bamberg, so I'm having to use my little Mikeller one, uh, the 330 millilitres one. I do have a Pilsner Urkel one, I've got two of them back home in Scotland, so I need to see if I can bring one of them across. Um, but yeah, so we'll use this one, we'll use the little 330 or the 300 millilitre one for the purposes of this video. So as you can see, this beer has poured a lovely, bright, golden um, yellow colour, golden pale straw, which is kind of exactly what you would expect from a Hellas beer. You could see there was a solid finger of a frothy, I would say perfect white head on this one, not creamy at all. Quite a bit of an active carbonation in this, but I do wonder if part of that is because the glass is pretty damn clean, to be honest with you. You'll always get a little bit more visible carbonation if the glass is, is pretty clean. But yeah, you can see a lot of the bubbles are kind of congregating, aggregating on the... Um, 
the bottom of that of the bottom of the glass. So um, yeah, lovely looking beer. This one. Some of your Hellas beers can be a little bit hazy, of course, but some breweries choose to filter them. And this one, obviously, I'm just going by its appearance, I think, is filtered. But in fairness, if I look at the bottom of it, I think there is a tiny little bit of sediment there on the bottom. So maybe we'll pour. We'll, have, we'll probably go through it because these beers are very easy drinking. But yeah, and um, we'll probably go through it and see what it tastes like if there is a little bit of sediment too. So um, yeah, exactly what you would expect in terms of appearance. Let's take a closer look at the aroma then and see how we get on. Yeah, very typical for the style. So you've got a nice little bit of that kind of bready quality there, that typical smooth German malt. I always used to call it the Brauhaus smoothness and probably Germans watching these videos laugh at me but that's the, for me, that's the characteristic of German beer. It's just the smoothness and to some degree as well the crispness that you'll get out of these beers. When you go to the smaller breweries in Germany and have their stuff on tap, it's, it's awesome. Um, you know, Germany and Belgium, of course, are the, the sort of home of craft beer and I guess Czech as well, although I think the communists destroyed a lot of the the older breweries in the Czech Republic, which was a, a shame, just a few of the bigger ones survived. Um, but yeah, the aroma in that beer is really nice. So nice little bit of a kind of smooth white bready quality in there. You can smell definitely a bit of pills and malt in here. It just comes across as being that little bit more crisp. There's a little bit of a biscuity sweetness in this one as well, a bit like McVitie's digestive biscuits. I'm not sure how good a reference that is for Germans watching this video right enough, um, but it really has a little bit of that. It, it's quite, to me, the aroma of this one, it's well balanced uh, with the sweetness in the malt base and the smoothness. Some of them can lean a little bit one way, some of them tend to be a little bit more bready and some of them do tend to be a little bit more sweet as well, but I think this one is really quite well balanced to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, on the hoppy side of things then, it's, it's that typical sort of noble hop quality, that light, kind of slightly smooth earthiness quite a bright floral quality and a nice little bit of grassiness too. You know, Hallertau and Tittenanger hops, the really distinctive thing about them for me is the little bit of earthiness and the way that the, the floral and grassy qualities come out. And this one is really, it, it, it's it's quite a, a, a mild beer, if you like, in terms of its aroma. It's not punchy in the same way as you're going to get from, you know, IPAs and stuff like this. But the German beers aren't like that. They're very, the, the German beers are more kind of focused on sessionability and kind of pureness, if you like, I guess you could say as well. Um, and that's, of course, until you go to the, the doppel box and things which are beasts. But um, yeah, this one, it's, it's a really nice aroma with this beer. In terms of the um, fruity side of things, this beer, it's got a little bit of that apple-y, pear-y ester that you expect from the style. Maybe a bit of a kind of citrusy zestiness, a little bit of a slightly lemony quality or something from the uh, from the grassy side of the hops as well. Um, so it has everything you'd expect. This one, again, it comes across really nice and smooth, a little bit of sweetness, those lovely kind of floral, grassy qualities that you would expect from... Um, those lovely kind of grassy floral qualities that you would expect of a, a nice German Hellas. But um, yeah, take a bit of time and enjoy that aroma before you taste the beer. But we are going to get stuck into this one now. So this one is the Hochbräu Original from Ho from the Stadtliches Hochbräuhaus München in Munich, Bavaria in Germany. Cool to finally get around to reviewing their sort of flagship beer, I guess you could say. Let's get stuck in. Slange, Skoll, Prost. Yeah, um, so again, this beer, it's really just nice and easy and drinkable. Um, you know, it's, you can really, when you try these sort of macro laggers and things like that, you can really taste the quality, uh, the difference in quality between something like this from Germany, which, you know, this. These beers are very traditional. That's one of the impressive things about German brewing is that they can brew really good quality beer on the high, on the big scale, if you like. And you know, the Paulaner and Hofboy are probably the two the two breweries in Munich that you really use as kind of benchmarks for that. Um, but yeah, the the quality of these beers is, I think, you know, it's it's very difficult to beat that. Lager beers are very difficult to do, and to do it on the big scale um, is pretty impressive. So to me, as a fan of this style, I really like this. This is a very, it's got, it's very clean, very crisp, and it's exactly 
what you would expect. So this beer for me, it's not doing anything surprising. I think it's a very nice example of the style. And I mean, I've been saying that a lot in videos recently, but when you've reviewed near enough 2,000 beers, it's, uh, you know, there's not too much that's going to kind of surprise you anymore. It's all about just trying different things and finding more beers that you like. So just to me, this comes across as a really nice kind of clean and crisp example of the Hellas style. This is definitely one of the more sort of, um, it's definitely one of the ones I think that leans, it almost leans a little bit towards being like a Pilsner or something in some ways. It's definitely one of the lighter, more crisp Hellas beers that you're going to come across. You do get ones that come across as more bready and things like this, but this is definitely one of the more kind of crisp um, examples of this style. So if you like, if that sounds like it will hit the spot for you, you will enjoy this one. So yeah, let's break the flavour of this down a little bit then. In the middle of your palate, you can feel that nice kind of um, white bready quality there. That just blankets the middle of your tongue. The further you go into the aftertaste, you're going to feel it almost dry out a little bit. And that's when you start to get the crispness. There's definitely some Pilsner malt in this one because it's given you that lovely crispness and as you move into the center of your palate and um, you get that little bit of a kind of oily McVitie's digestive biscuity kind of quality out of this beer and of course that's the alcohol flavors coming out of this one you always get the sweetness that kind of biscuity almost slightly um but just that biscuity oily kind of thing it's not strong enough to be caramel but that those biscuity but slightly brown sugary flavours that you get in these beers are always the um, the things that are covering the alcohol up. Um, the hoppy side of this beer is really nice and crisp as well. So yeah, um, on the hoppy side of things then, the back corners of your palate, you've got a really nice little bit of earthiness. And the German earthiness, of course, compared to the English earthiness, which is, is generally quite dark, and, um, you know, quite dark and, how would you say, quite bitter, actually. The German earthiness is really quite smooth, so you get a little bit of that in the back corners of the palate, but then as you come forward, and um, this beer very quickly changes to be quite floral. I think this must be quite a fresh batch of this beer, to be honest with you. Um, but as you come further forward along the, the front, sides of your tongue there and you get a nice little bit of that kind of floral note and it's almost just a teeny bit spicy. I'd be curious if it's like Magnum, German Magnum or something that's in this rather than Hather Tower Tetnanger, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I've got a feeling that this beer is a little bit more hoppy than some of the other Hellas beers that you're going to come across right enough. But again, it could just be because it's a little bit fresh and it may well just be the Haller Tower or Tetnanger hops that are in this. I think Haller Tower is more likely to be Haller Tower than Tetnanger because Haller Tower is a Bavarian hop. I'm sure that Tetnanger is from a little bit further north. Um, but yeah, it's really that this these beer this the crispness that you get on the edge of the tongue here from the hops is really nice. Around the very front curve of the palate, it's just that little bit lighter and grassy, of course, and behind the front curve of the tongue, that's where you get that nice oily bubble where those juicy fruity esters kind of push their way out of the beer. And this one again is doing exactly what you would expect if you know this style. Yeah, so in that oily bubble, it's um, in the beginning, it sort of leans a little bit more towards the citricy side of things. You do get a little bit of an almost lemony citric to it, uh, citrusiness, I should say. But then the further you go into the aftertaste with it, it starts to lean more towards a kind of... Um, it yeah, it really does start to lean more towards being a little bit more apple and pear and things. But then at the back of that oily bubble you start to get some of the more kind of stronger citricy notes out of this one which is quite nice I mean it's not tart at all don't get me wrong with that when I'm saying citric I always think of tart and um, but this beer it's 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 a very typical um, example of the the Hellas style I mean as I say if you're a fan of this beer style this one comes across as a very nice clean crisp example and it doesn't it doesn't do anything surprising you know it's just a very very good example but in fairness it is one of the benchmarks as well so um, you need to keep that in mind but yeah this is definitely one of the more crisp almost Pilsner like um, Hellas beers that I've come across to be honest um, and I really like it I certainly wouldn't hesitate to drink it again the Dunkel I remember being quite light and I think just going from memory, I remember thinking the Hofbrau, the Hofbräu 
beers were very light and drinkable compared to um, to some of the other ones. They're all drinkable, but these ones especially. So I think that's definitely fair to say. But yeah, it's it's a really all you can say about this is it's a really nice example of the style and it is one of the benchmarks so that's not at all surprising state the obvious but um yeah i wouldn't hesitate to drink this again this is a really nice just sessionable hellas beer it's one of the it definitely one of the more crisp examples and crisp and hoppy examples i've come across of this style and it says on the back here it's best before the 3rd of september 2020 so i'm guessing that this one might have been bottled on the 3rd of September 2019. So at this point in time, it's the 25th of November. So this one's just shy. It's probably about six weeks old. Um, six, seven weeks old at the point that I'm filming this for you. So yeah, it would, it would still be fairly fresh at that point in time, actually, which might explain the the sort of hoppiness that this beer has. But it really works like that as well. Um, so yeah, in terms of the mouthfeel then, um, I would say that this beer is quite a light bodied beer. Pushing the top end of light bodied I'd say though. The carbonation is really crisp in this one. Um, the mouthfeel overall I think is light, wet, crisp. I think it's fair to say that with this beer. In terms of the bitterness, um, I think we're talking about 25-ish, maybe even 30 IBUs. It might be a bit less than that just because of how fresh this beer appears but definitely one of the more hoppy hellas beers I've come across in recent times but it's been a while since I've had one right enough um, but yeah and I'd say about 25 to 30 IBUs in this beer um, malt base is quite smooth I would say again it's got a nice kind of element of crispness to it and a little touch of sweetness also and you've just got a wee bit of um, of sweetness uh, from the or a little bit of juiciness from the fruit as well but overall a beautiful example of the Hellas style of beer. If you like your Hellas to be a little bit more crisp, then this is definitely the one to go for, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's all you can really say about this beer. I mean, it's a very nice example of the style, one of the benchmarks of the style, of course, as well, and uh, one of the more crisp examples. So, um, yeah, let's just leave it at that for this one. It's been really nice to kind of come back and reflect on this beer a little bit because it's one that I am fairly familiar with, or was fairly familiar with already before trying it, but it's nice to kind of get to this one and do a sit-down review for you. So I hope that you guys have enjoyed me um, come at, like talking a little bit about a beer that I do know, uh, do know a little bit about. But yeah, a really nice crisp example of the Munich Hellas style, which I personally think is a very underrated beer style. I'd love to see some of the more modern kind of craft breweries experimenting with the Hellas and the Dunkel and things like that, especially the Hellas, because you can use all of these different hops, like, you know, Nelson Sauvin, Hallertau Blanc, um, Enigma from Australia as well, and even Galaxy and stuff. It would be really cool to see some of these beers is to see some of these hops used in a Hellas beer for experimentation and see how that comes out. I know that um, Schneiderweiss, of course, they made a Weizen uh, Bock with, um, was it a Weizen Bock or just a Hefeweizen? But they made one with Nelson Sauvin and it was absolutely beautiful, I have to say. So I'd love to see more breweries experimenting with these new world hops and stuff and, uh, and playing with this style. I really think the German Lagers are a very underrated style of beer. The Doppelbox, the Schwarz beers, uh, the, the Hellas and the Mute and the the Dunkels, of course, and you've got the Czech equivalents as well, the Svetli, Leitzak, uh, Cherny and Tamavis. You know, it's, it's a shame that these beer styles are so overlooked in terms of IPAs and things these days. But yeah, really cool to do a more another classic German review for you, so we'll leave it at that. So once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on the beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Hofbräu München as well. I do hope that I can review their Hefeweizen at some point, because obviously that's a beer that's played quite a big role in the history of this company so I'll need to see if I can get a hold of that but um, it's been awesome to review one this one for you a beer that I was familiar with but just never had done a review for so have a go at this one for yourself and just see what you think check out my social media let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below and you will see more from Hofbräu München over the next uh, over the next little while actually we'll need to get another review done I've only done two from these guys so far and we will need to fix that but thank you again for watching and I will catch you guys very soon make sure you check out my good friend Peter over at the Clueless Drinker. He's a big fan of the German Lagers as well. I'm not sure if he's reviewed this one, but he has reviewed a good number of the famous Munich beers. So give him, uh, go and check him out, give him your support, and uh, check out some of his German Lager reviews if that's what you're into. But this one was the Hofbräu Original, 5.1% uh, Munich Hellas beer. 
from uh, the Stadtliche Stately um, Hofbräu München Brewery. So, yeah, once again, thank you for watching, and I will catch you guys very soon. Slanju, Skull, Prost, cheers. Make sure you check out this beer and do have a go at some different German lagers. Cheers.